Are we live? Hello. Hey guys, what's up everyone? So Guy M Z, how's it going? Disco Chicksify. Hey. Uh Po Po, thanks for joining. Daniel, the multitasker. Thanks for joining. Glad you could join. Elias, what's up? Tana Bro Soil. Soul? Tana Bro Soul. What's up, Losh? Nice of you to join. Hey, is this dark enough? Or do I need to be even darker? <laughs> There's a little bit of light outside. Hopefully it gets uh, full dark soon. Hey, Disappointment Juice. How's it going? What kind of name is that? Tori. What's up, Tori? Danny. Swan. Ines. Dan. Toho fan kid. I'm summoning spirits. Correct. Uh, I have a, I have a candle here, but I don't think you guys can see. Um, yeah, a little bit, a little bit. But at least there's a little bit of thing, a little bit of light shining on my face. Do, 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 do. All right. You're crocheting a cobweb right now. Awesome. Okay. It's too bright. It's too bright. You want it to be even darker? I can do it like this. How about this? <laughs> this is uh, very dark for you. Hold on. There you go. I think that's way too dark. But How about now? Make it a little bit darker. Because I need to see too. Reading in the dark is bad for your eyes. All right. Shout out. What's up, Samira? How's it going? Glad you could join. All right, what we're doing today, what we're doing today is we're going to be reading some Japanese folk tales, okay? These are really short. I have a whole, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of them. Um, these are going to be really short. Um, each story is like really short, so I think we can go through like a, a lot of them, okay? And then I, uh, I guess you guys can get, you guys get to choose which one was we do. So, all right, there's a bunch of them. Um, let's see, there's a session about priests, temples, and shrines. Um, I haven't read these yet, so I'll be, I'll be experiencing it uh, nude, uh, just like you guys. This one looks promising. The priests who ate the corpse. Then we got monsters. We got kappas. We got tengu. All right, we got mountain giants. All right, part three, uh, spirits. We want to read something about spirits. Transformations. So people turning into things. Foxes turning into other things. All right. We got heroes and strong men. We got chojas, I think, which are um, rich peasants. We got knaves, like bad people. We got places, all right. Okay, so I don't know how we do this. I guess you guys, uh, you guys can choose. All right, who wants to do? Okay, I think the priest who ate the corpse sounds like a good one to start. But then there are also kappas. All right, let's start with this. We can do, I think we can do kappas later. Um, Cause it's Halloween, it fits the theme. The kappa who played pull my finger. Okay, I think we gotta do that. <clears throat> the priest one first and then the, the kappa who played pull finger. Awesome. All right, let's do that. Uh, I think I need to make a mark 
to know that I've done it. Okay. Red. <clears throat> All right, the priest who ate the corpse. Are you guys ready? Formerly, there was a temple called Tokusu-in at the southern side of Anyo-in in Shiba Park. A man who lived in Hiro asked the Tokusu-in to perform the necessary rituals for a certain dead man. The temple accepted the request and sent a hanger-on priest to the house of the dead. By mistake, that priest cut off about one inch of the dead man's head when he shaved his hair. As he thought he could not make the proper apologies for his error, he put the piece of flesh into his mouth. To his surprise, it tasted very good. After that, he could not forget that taste. He wished to eat such flesh once more. So one night, he secretly dug up the corpse and cut it into pieces to eat. This time the flesh tasted more delicious than the flesh of the and the flesh of the head. He wanted to try once more. Soon after that, a new corpse was buried in the grave. The priest thought it a good opportunity. He stole into the graveyard in the dead of the night and dug up the corpse and ate it up. Thus, again and again, he dug up the grave whenever a new corpse was buried. At first, the chief priest of the temple thought that some dogs or foxes had done these things, but as the matter became more and more horrible, he grew suspicious. Other people, too, grew curious about the affair. One night, when the priest was at last caught on the spot, he had to confess all about eating the corpses. He was exiled and driven away. After he had wandered through many places, he came back to Edo again and became an ombo. When he was about to eat, okay, I think we need to know what these are. So an ombo is a person whose trade is dealing with dead bodies, okay. And a kasha is a specter which bears away dead bodies, okay. So after he had wandered through many places, he came back to Edo again and became an ombo. When he was about to eat, suddenly Akasha appeared on a dark cloud and took the priest up in the sky, tore his body into pieces, and disappeared. It is not clear when this event happened, but it is said that during the era of Kansei, there was, an, there was in Edo a priest who ate men. Okay, that's it. <laughs> How's that? Yeah, I told you, these, are, these can be really short. Some of them are a couple of pages, though. What a lovely story. Yeah, would you... How, how about it, guys? Would you guys eat corpses? Okay, I have these. I have a snack for myself. I don't know if you can see it. It's a Pocky stick, but it's salad flavored. I, don't, I have no idea why. And then this says it's already expired, so... Why would you make an, a salad pocky stick? Jake! Thanks for the super chat. I appreciate it. No, you prefer live humans? Okay. Alright, let's see what this salad stick... Tastes like. Um, just tastes like bread. Salad tastes like sadness. Hmm. I taste some. Is it? I taste some cucumber. Yeah, it's expired. It says expired um, this September. <clears throat> so, expired two months ago. <laughs> I 
All right, what next? We had the Kappa who played Poor Finger. Why not? Let's do that. <clears throat> All right, the Kappa who played Pool Finger. There is a pond called Akanuma Ike at the foot of Mount Tateshina, and near the pond there is a big stone called Kagihiki River. Kagihiki Ishi, Pool Finger Stone. Once a child used to stand on that stone and call to the passersby, "Let's play Pool Finger." The passersby would stop and play Pool Finger for fun. Then the child would pull them into the pond and eat them up. Many people were killed in that way. At last, the people decided that the child must be a kappa, who lived in the pond. A man named Taki Tachiki from Suwa said, "I will destroy the kappa." He asked his lord if he could borrow a good horse. Then he rode by this stone, and as he expected, the child asked him to play pull finger. He answered the child, "All right." And they locked fingers. No sooner had they locked fingers than he whipped the horse and rode as fast as he could. The child could not bear to be dragged by the horse. He said, "Please excuse me. I am really the kappa of Akanuma Pond. Please don't kill me. Then I will teach you the secret of bone setting." And the man said, "Then teach me the secret." The kappa caught, taught him in detail. Because you've taught me the secret of bone set. Oh wait, this is him talking. Because you've taught me the secret of bone setting, I will set you free. But if you continue to live in this place, you might have the desire to eat people again. So go somewhere else tonight," said the man. So the kappa went away to the pond of Wadamura, and he had been living there quietly. And this Tachiki is said to be the founder of the family line of the famous surgeon Tachiki. Oh, that's it. Yeah, that was super short. Hey, Carlstead! Thanks for the super chat. May the wind always be favorable when you bike, and may chubby puppies kiss your face. Well, thank you so much. Did I compile this list myself? No, we're just going through. Hey, whatever you guys want to read.、Uh, which one looks tempting to read? Da, 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 da. Shrine of the Vengeful Spirit, Kappa Bone Setter. A grateful one, a wrestling one. Princesses, human sacrifice. The priest's towel. The priest and corpse. We already read that. The priest's towel. Why? All right, tales of Tengu next. Okay. All right, we do、uh, the the towel. Why do you want to read about the priest's towel? Do 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 do. A tenugui, tenugui is a Japanese style towel or face cloth. All right. All right. This is the story of the priest's towel. The young wife of a household kindly gave a piece of mochi to a traveling priest who came by the door. Afterwards, her mother-in-law counted the pieces of mochi and realized that the young wife had given one to the priest. She scolded the young wife and sent her to regain the mochi from the priest. When the priest heard the young wife's honest plea, he not only returned her the mochi. But he also gave her a tenugui, praising her gentleness, which is like a little face towel. Acting on his suggestion, the young wife wiped her face with that tenugui every day. Then her face became extremely beautiful. 
The mother-in-law envied her and borrowed her tenugui to use it herself. However, the mother-in-law's face gradually became horse-like, and at last it turned into a horse's face. What? The daughter-in-law felt very sorry for her and went to the priest and begged him to turn the mother's face back to normal. The priest said that when a greedy woman wiped her face with a tenugui, her face would turn into a horse's face, and he instructed her to tell the mother-in-law to rub her face with the reverse side of the tenugui. The young wife hastily went home and relayed the instructions to her mother-in-law. When the mother did as she was told, her face became as it had been before, and thereafter she turned into a good-hearted woman and loved her mother and loved her daughter-in-law. Oh, hey, what a nice, uh, happy ending. Uh, I guess, uh, yeah, I guess the moral of the story is not to be greedy. So I guess uh, her borrowing the towel is like something that is supposed to be super, super greedy. Horses have beautiful faces? Okay. Why, Losh? Do you have a horse's face? See, I doubted the towel. Okay, it's a, that was a happy ending, I guess. All right, did we want uh, a Tengu story? I think someone said that. Tales of Tengu. Whoa, that's a lot of notes. We all know what a Tengu is, right? Okay. Tales of Tengu. You want to hear a Kitsune tale too? Okay, I think there were some fox stories. Oh, these are like a lot of them. A lot of very short ones. Okay, hey, we get to learn some, some little tidbits about the Tengu. Right, the Stone of the Tengu's Heel. Near the top of Mount Shira at Inaba, Asahimura, Higashi Kagus Kasugai-kun, there is an old stone about three feet in diameter. It is called Tengu no Kakato Iwa, the Stone of the Tengu's Heel. Hmm. On the surface of the stone, there is a hollow in the shape of a heel of a big foot facing the east. It is said that the Tengu who lived in this mountain in ancient days, intending to go one night to Mount Sarunage on an errand, stepped on this stone and jumped a big jump eastward, leaving his footprint on the stone. People say that there is a Tengu still living on Mount Shira and that the Tengu's fire is sometimes seen on dark rainy nights. All right, next let's do a Let's do a fox story, okay? A kitsune story. The Tengu's fire. There is a big pine tree at Kita Takai in Yamato Mura, Nakajimagun. It is said that Yama, Yamato Takeru no Mikoto, a hero of mythological, mythological, mythological history, once put this sedge hat on this tree. The villagers often see a strange fire moving between this tree and the old cedar tree at Kumano Shrine in Kita Takai. This is said to be caused by the Tengu, who has his residence on the tops of these two trees and comes and goes between them. The Tengu's Pine There was a big pine tree in the precincts of Shime Shrine at Kanesato, Tomitamura. A Tengu had lived there since ancient times. When he was in good humor, his laughter was heard throughout the village, and the village was left in peace. But when he was offended, he did violence and frightened the villagers. This tree fell down in the severe storm of 1921. What is a Tengu? Is this dude right here. Oh, that's it? <clears throat> All right, let's, let's read about this. The Tengu Pine and Takegoro. This legend describes a customary Tengu practice of kami kakushi, divine kidnapping. Okay. There is an old pine tree which stands as a mark for boatmen sailing in Lake Shinji. 
As eight branches issue forth from its trunk, it is sometimes called the eight branch pine. People say that if a man cuts off a small twig, will wait. People say that if a man cuts off a small twig, it will sh it will shed red blood, and the whole mountain will rumble, and the man will be divided into eight pieces on the spot. Therefore, no one dares touch it with cutlery. In olden times, a small shrine stood beneath that tree. Though now nothing of the sort remains. Evenings, when the white waterfall of Mount Mitaki was colored crimson by the setting sun, the young Tengu, fatigued from play, used to come back to that pine tree. The old Tengu flew down from the mountain to take them back. In the morning, the old Tengu came down again with the little Tengu to let them play by themselves. An honest man named Takegoro, who lived near the pine tree, was wont from his youth to see those Tengu who came every morning and returned every evening. One night it happened that he disappeared on the way back from the village meeting. The, the neighbors thought he might have been taken away by the gods. They searched for him, ringing the bell and beating the drum for three days and nights, though all in vain. But on the fifth evening, he came back from somewhere with his clothes torn to pieces. His face was pale, and his eyes glittered strangely. He had a stick in his hand, which thenceforth he always kept beside him. From that time on, every day when the old Tengu sent the little Tengu off, Takegoro emerged from his house and, looking up at the sky and shaking the stick heavenwards, cried out, Wait a minute, wait a minute! In response, a voice from the sky rumbled, Ho! The next moment, Takegoro would disappear, and his voice would be heard from the top of the pine tree talking with the old Tengu. After a while, Takegoro appeared in the sky, flying around here and there, since he had been once abducted by the Tengu. Thenceforth, he must fly with the Tengu every day. In addition, Takegoro was often threatened by the Tengu, that at his slightest disobedience, at his slightest disobedient deed, he would be thrown down into the stormy sea or dashed upon the cruel rocks. Sometimes they held feasts on the Tengu pine. On such occasions, the Tengu would say, pointing to a wealthy safe brewer's house below the river, Let's burn that house and drink sake while viewing the house in flames. Only with great pains could Takegoro check the Tengu from carrying out this design. Takegoro served the Tengu in that fashion for more than 20 years. Well, when he became old, it grew burdensome to him to fly with the Tengu. So he asked to be relieved from the service. Then the Tengu said, There is no one so honest and attractive as you, but now I cannot deny your request to take leave of me. I know of another man in Hikawa. I shall make him my servant from now on. Even after that, however, the Tengu sometimes visited Takegoro. Once when his wife was weaving, a wind from the Tengu suddenly blew into the house, and the sound of clink, clink was heard inside. As Takegoro touched the spot with his stick, there came into view many coins. When he was making a mortar from a, from a log, the edge of his hatchet was blunted from coins within the log. Takegoro often met with such happenings, and by and by he became quite rich. While he was supervising workers in making a road, he, str he struck a stick he was holding against the stones, which had been picked up from the river for the road bed. The stones split in two, and glittering gold coins dropped out. He paid the workers with those coins, and moreover, and moreover he entertained them with sake. The villagers admired him greatly calling him Old Father Luik. After he retired from work, he often invited the Tengu to his home as a precious guest and feasted him. Until the feast ended and the Tengu left, no other members of the house could enter the room. Ah, okay. Okay, that was a kind of a good story. It started out as a, as a kidnapping, but, um... But um, uh, it turned out well afterwards. You like that story? Yeah, he made a he made a Tengu friend. Nice reward for an abusive relationship. Uh, true, he was kind of a servant. Uh, 
Well, I guess that was a kind of a that, that was kind of an okay Tengu. Okay, he didn't uh didn't cause too much trouble. And he took the kid on some adventures. All right, do we want a Kitsune story next? I thought I saw some foxes. What's the name of the book? Um, it's called Folk Legends of Japan by Richard M. Dorson. There you go. Oh, I should have put a link in the description. Whoops. All right, do we want a fox? All right, we have fox demons, fox wrestler, fox wife. Ghost story next. All right, ghost story next. Let's do a fox. All right. Which is it? One of three. Demon, fox wrestler, or wife. Demons or all three? We can do all three. All right. Well, we can do all three. Whoa. All right. We know what. Foxes are right. This is uh, the fox demons. <clears throat> Once a humorous man named Santaro, while on his way to town, saw several foxes lying in the sun. <clears throat> he drew near the foxes quietly and then suddenly shouted to surprise them. Taken unaware, the foxes jumped up about ten feet high and immediately ran away to the mountains, looking back and making their tails round. Santa, Santa, Santa was pleased to see them running away and said to himself, laughing, I've heard that foxes foresee events which will happen even a thousand days later, but now I know it's not true at all. They can't tell what's going to happen right now. They're nothing but animals. He told this to every person he met in town, heaping ridicule on the fox. Oh, not good. He bought some fish, and when evening came, started home. Soon night fell, and it grew too dark to walk on. Santa, Santa, Santa looked around and noticed a light some distance away. He proceeded to the house from which the light came and asked for a night's lodging. There was only a white haired old woman in the house who agreed to put him up, and then said, Now I am going to my neighbors, so I want you to look after the house while I am away. And she went out. Santa felt uneasy when he was left alone, and waited impatiently for the old woman to come back. In the meantime, the fire grew low. Santa looked for something to burn. Then he saw a white object in the corner. What is it? he wondered, and looked at it more closely. It was a dead man, and to his surprise the corpse began to get up, groaning the while. Stricken with terror, Santa rushed out of the house. The dead man ran after him, uttering sounds with wide open mouth and outstretched hands. Santa feared that he might be caught by the dead man, and without a moment's thought, climbed the big tree standing near him. The dead man failed to see this and passed by, groaning. Oh, is this the first... Japanese zombie? Santa felt relieved. Thank God, he thought, but I wish the morning would come soon. At last, day dawned in the east. As it grew light, Santa perceived that the tree was a persimmon and that its upper branches bore fruit. He climbed higher up the tree in order to get the persimmons, but the branch broke under his weight and he toppled from the tree. Unhappily, the tree hung over a river bank and he dropped into the water. However, he suffered no injury and only felt quite chilly. Then suddenly, he became conscious of himself crawling around on the spot where he had surprised the foxes that morning. The fish that he had bought were, of course, gone. Okay. 
Damn, Santa had a weird dream, didn't he? Okay, right, so I guess all of that was just the fox's um, uh, illusions, right? I think that's the point of the story. No persimmons for you. <clears throat> yeah, see, that's what happens. Okay, don't don't try to don't try to yell at Kitsune. All right, we got the fox wrestler. Let's see what this is about. <clears throat> the Fox Wrestler In my childhood, my storyteller was a windowsill library which my father, a Buddhist priest, had made for the convenience of the children in the neighborhood. It contained many books. Almost all of them were recommended by Mrs. Carl Schultz, a specialist in juvenile literature. One Thursday, recently, I returned home after your lecture, wondering whether or not I knew something that could be called a folk tale. The only tales I seemed able to remember were those of Grimm or Anderson, or some famous Japanese animal tales. I racked my brains. I don't know any unique folk tale that was told me directly. After a while, I recalled a tale related by my grandmother, and I have decided to set it down here, because I know my grandmother believed the story. This is what she said. <clears throat> Should I do a grandmother voice? Oh, God. When your mother... <laughs> When your mother was a child, the graveyard at the back of this temple was thickly covered with bamboo grass, and it was said that foxes were living there. The autumn that your mother reached the age of seven, she is now fifty-two, we celebrated her Shichigo-sang, inviting our neighbors in to dinner. The guests returned to their homes in high good spirits, each carrying an orizume in his hand. Gunbei san, a farmer, took a shortcut back to his house through the overgrown graveyard, in spite of our warning not to. He was a tall, powerful man, and oh, that evening he was fairly drunk. Next morning he was back at our house with a thoroughly sober appearance, and told us of an astonishing experience he had had the previous night on his way home. As he was hurrying through the bamboo grove, he was stopped by a strange man who appeared to be about his age. Hey you, let's have a sumo match, the stranger said to Genbei san. Since Genbei san was big and strong and had been boasting of his strength, he immediately agreed. It was a close contest and neither man could emerge victor. When both became tired, they stopped to take a rest. A few moments later, Genbei san discovered that the stranger had disappeared without his having noticed. Feeling totally bewildered, he returned to his home. When he opened the orizume with his family, he received a further surprise. Broiled bream, lobster fritters, chicken al ca and casserole, all were gone. Only two dishes, yokang and kingtong, remained in the box. Oh, that's it? Oh, wait. <clears throat> oh, there's more. It was surely a fox that had done such mischief, concluded my grandmother, nodding sagely. Then she added, Of course it was quite natural that there should be foxes living there, since brush had grown so thickly on that graveyard. After I returned home, I brought the story into our dinner table conversation. Pretending to be a folklorist, I concealed my real intent from my family. I talked on as if I were merely retelling a remnant reminiscence of my late grandmother, but I was surprised to find my father and mother apparently believed this story. Father even told me of another man who was tricked by a fox and made to walk all night in the woods. So I am convinced that folklore can be found nowadays just as in olden times. It will, least, it will last at least another generation. Oh yes, that often happens after drinking sake. True. All right, this is our third fox story. The fox wife. Hmm. 
Once there lived on a hill on the way to Kido, a farmer named Narinobu. The road started from Nishina Nishihara in wait Nishinara in Nogoga. The road started from Nishihara in Ichinomiya, past the Narinmo, Narinobu Bridge and Bonji Pond, and led to Kido. One night, a beautiful woman came to his home and asked him to make her his wife. He granted her request and married her. Not long after that, she bore a boy whom they named Morime, and whom they loved. One year, the boy fell ill in bed. And the parents tended him day and night. It was May, but Narinobu's wet rice field alone lay waste and unplanted. He was worrying about it in his heart. Then one morning, when he went out, he beheld his rice field completely planted. However, he discovered that all the rice plants were planted upside down. Astonished, he ran into the house. We had you. You can plant rice plants upside down. Astonished, he ran into the house to tell his wife, but he saw that there, but he saw there a fox's tail hanging out of his wife's bed. His wife awakened and realized that her real form, that of a fox, was now discovered. No. When her husband told her that the rice plants were planted upside down, she took the child in her arms and went out into the rice field. There, she repeated the following poem three times. Be fruitful, my child shall eat plenty. The inspector shall pass over, bear fruit in the husk. No sooner had she finished the last word than the rice plants turned over erectly and grew high and thick before her eyes. Leaving her child to her husband, she waved her hand to the sky. Then a black cloud appeared, and with a gust of wind, turned day into night. In the darkness, the fox wife disappeared, rolling up the arrowroot leaves scattered nearby. For that reason, arrowroot leaves always show their undersides. The autumn came, but nevertheless, the rice plants of Narinobu's fields did not come up, did not come into ears. The officers who inspected the field therefore exempted Narinobu from rice taxes. However, the ears ripened in the husk, and the harvest was plentiful. Oh, yay! All right, hey, that was a. These are all pretty uh, good stories with happy endings. Where are the bad endings? Come on. All right. What else did we want? Did we want a ghost story? Like spirits. <clears throat> the ghost that cared for a child. Oh, that sounds nice. All right, let's do that. While we do that, you guys, uh, I don't know. You guys pick another one, okay? The ghost that cared for a child. So ame is a caramel-like candy made of wheat or rice gluten. Okay. The phantom boat. Seven blind and minstrels. Gotcha. All right. Remind me. Okay. After this. All right. The ghost that cared for a child. A long time ago, someone... Someone knocked feebly at the door of a certain confectionery shop at Yasuhara Machi, Dategun. It was midnight. When the shopkeeper got up and opened the door, a woman slipped into the house. It was a young woman, but her hair was disheveled, and she wore white clothes. She had a newborn baby in her arms. Nervously putting up her frowsy, loose-hanging hair with her lingers, she said that she wanted some ame and handed a penny to the shopkeeper. He felt suspicious, but put some ame on a stick and gave it to the woman. She thanked him and went out of the shop. Next night and the following nights, she visited the shop at the same time and with the same appearance, and each time bought a penny's worth of ame. 
The shopkeeper thought it very strange. One day, when he met a painter who was an old acquaintance, he told him about the woman. The painter also had suspicions. He asked the shopkeeper for his permission to stay at his house that night and observe the woman. The shopkeeper agreed. That evening, the painter visited the shop with drawing paper and brush, bringing along sake and some food. He spent hours talking and drinking sake with the shopkeeper until midnight. Then there was heard the same knock at the door as on the previous nights. The shopkeeper opened the door, winking at the painter, and the woman slipped in and demanded a penny's worth of, an, of ame. I think that's a, a typo. While the shopkeeper was intentionally taking time putting the ame on a stick, the painter who had hidden himself in the rear of the shop drew a portrait of the woman. A young man of Hashiramura, sobering up from the effects of sake that he had drunk at a wine shop, was walking homeward along a lonely, drizzly path one midnight, murmuring a little song. Suddenly he heard a baby's cry behind him. He stood still to listen to it. Who on earth was coming that way with a crying baby at the dead of night? He thought he would wait for the person and walk with him, so he remained by the wayside. As the baby's cry came closer, he looked in the direction of the sound. There was a woman in white clothes with disheveled hair coming towards him with a crying baby in her arms. She hardly seemed to be a woman of this world. The young man was astonished. Soon the strange woman slipped past him and went toward Hashira, Hashiramura. The young man, as soon as he came to himself, followed after her from curiosity or he might have been bewitched by the woman. When she came to the graveyard of Tokoji at Hashiramura, she turned back and smiled at the young man. No sooner did she do so than a fiery host set the night ablaze, and she disappeared in the smoke. The young man lost his senses on the spot. Next morning, the priest of the temple cared for him and sent him back home. So she just... She just turned into fire and disappeared. The wife of a certain farmer at Hashiramura, who was in her last month of pregnancy, died of a sudden illness. On the 49th night after her death, the 49 rice cakes that had been offered before the tablet of the deceased in the temple disappeared. People grew suspicious and examined the graveyard, finding a big hole dug beside the, a new grave. The relatives talked over the matter and decided to open the tomb in the presence of the village officials. When they dug up the coffin and opened it, they saw that the corpse looked as if death had just occurred. Still, more strange to say, it embraced a bebe in the sleeves of its shroud, and the bebe had grown fat and was licking a piece of rice cake, which he had, was holding in his hands. All the people were astounded at the sight. The child had been born alive in the coffin after the funeral ceremony had been performed. The people tried to separate the child from the dead mother, but they could not because she would not loosen her arms. After a consultation, they took a woman who had, been, who had a newborn baby to the corpse and had her show her breast and speak to the dead one, saying that she would give milk to the bebe and that the other need have no worry if she entrusted the child to their care. Then the dead woman loosened her embrace and let the bebe be taken from her arms. The rice cakes that had vanished from the temple and six ame sticks were found inside the coffin. Whoa. Okay. Yeah, so this spirit is a, an ubume. It's a yokai that... Um, that is a mother that uh, carries a, um, a baby, right? I think an ubame usually has um, blood on her belly. <clears throat> yeah. So, yeah. So, I, uh, the, the ubume usually is created after a mother died um, giving birth, I believe. Sindel Nick, you're a new mother and you just love this story. Awesome. Hey, congratulations. Oh, and thanks for the super chat. I appreciate it. 
yeah, I think this is also a good story, right? Um, dum, 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 dum. They found a live baby, and it is not in a coffin. <clears throat> Uh, that was the ghost that cared for a child. All right. Wh um, what do we want? The seven blind minstrels. Okay, let's do that. You watch my channel in pregnancy when you can't move much. Oh, awesome. All right, seven blind minstrels and the phantom boat. Gotcha. Wait, let me eat my um my salad sticks. Cuz why not? My expired salad sticks. Have I ever done a stream like this before? I did, um, I think, not last year, but the year before. I also did a ghost story one for Halloween. <laughs> Whoa! Peepzilla! Thank you so much. I appreciate it. <clears throat> it tastes kind of like, uh, like lettuce, I think. Just a little bit. But I do taste cucumber. I mean, I like cucumber, but... <clears throat> what am I drinking? I am drinking... Some green tea. I have my little green tea thing, a little green tea set. Jake Shuri, thanks so much. I appreciate it. You wonder if there are Tanuki stories in the book? Uh, yeah, we can, we can look for Tanuki. I'm not sure. I, I didn't see any. Are you drinking boba? I wish. I wish I had some boba, but no, unfortunately not. That's why tomorrow, I will probably get some. Does lettuce have a taste? It does, right? A little bit. Tastes kind of, um... Tastes kind of, um, vegetable-y. <laughs> Look, I like lettuce, okay? <clears throat> it's actually really good. And it's like, it's crunchy, and it's kind of refreshing. Yeah, and it's a it's a it's a vegetable, so it must be good for you, right? What's up, Mickey? Nice of you to join. All right, all right, right. You feel like grass has more taste than lettuce? Well, of course, grass has more taste. Grass tastes disgusting. Oh, when I was young, my dad made me eat wheatgrass or drink wheatgrass. Um, yeah, he would grind it up into this juice and he made me drink it and it was disgusting okay he thought it was good for you but like i found out later no it's not even that good for you yeah that was torture can you read the story about the mirror given by a spirit okay we, we can do that next remind me all right this is the seven blind minstrels <clears throat> At the border of Shimo Tsuguramura, Kita Shidaragun, Aichiken, alongside the road leading to Futo of Furikusa Mura, oh god, there stand seven round stones in a row, which are called the tombs of Shichi Ninsato, the seven blind minstrels. As one goes on and passes those tombs, the road slopes down. This slope is called Sando no Saka, blind minstrels' slope. Long ago, seven blind minstrels who traveled together lost their way in this slope. They asked the road of a man. Oh, wait. They asked the road of a man who was cutting the grass nearby. He told them the wrong way on purpose. 
So the blind men lost their way in the mountains. When they reached the top of the slope and came to the pool, now called Biwa Buchi, Pool of the Lute, they could go neither forward nor back, and all seven fell down together into the pool and died. Thereafter, because of the curse of these blind minstrels, the family of the man who gave them the wrong directions has suffered from sore eyes in each generation up to the present day. Once a member of the family had eyes carved on the tombstones of the blind men, perhaps because he thought he could console their spirits that way. So now all those stones have eyes carved upon them. It is told, however, that this had no effect. Okay. Well, it serves him right. <laughs> why, would you, why would you do that? Hey, is this true? Can we look it up? Hold up. Hold on. Hold on. Chi Chi Nin Zato. Um, Sando no Saka. Oh, Wagyu sandwich. Hey, yo, yo, that looks uncooked, though. No, oh, seven blind minstrels. Okay, well, if this place existed, um, it's not very popular. Okay, never mind. <clears throat> Alright, that was the Seven Blind Minstrels. Was super short. Um, Phantom Boat, right? What was the other one? Someone said. Oh, the mirror given by the ghost. Okay, we'll do that next. I don't know how long we'll go for, okay? It's when I feel like it. <clears throat> the phantom boat. Apparently, every village investigated has a story of a ghost boat. All right, the phantom boat. It was a mild autumn evening. A gentle west wind was blowing. Although our boat was under full sail, it did not move so swiftly as to, pre as to prevent our being at ease while steering. We were homeward bound from the sea of Satsuma, where we had been engaged in fishing. Our craft was sailing between Amakusa Island and Ch Chichiwa Bay. Mount Unzen hove in sight, and we, we expected to reach the shore by daybreak. The boatmen were all asleep. Only I was awake, steering the boat. <clears throat> it was perhaps a little after midnight when I became drowsy. I was about to smoke tobacco. Then I heard the sound of a boat moving on our left, Wonderingly, I looked up. I saw a sailing ship going ahead at a great speed against the wind. It was indeed strange, but I hesitated to wake up the other men who were sleeping peacefully, so I watched the mysterious vessel with close attention. The ship was drawing nearer. Although it was still at some distance, I could see the ship so clearly that if some acquaintance had been on board, I could have recognized him. The ship had only one side. The yard was just set on the mast without braces. Yet the ship was sailing safely in the face of the wind. The people on board were crying out, but I could not hear them well. It is a custom at sea that if we are spoken to by another ship, we are obliged to answer them. But if we know that it is not an ordinary ship, then we should not answer. 
I hear that the people on such boats often demand that we lend them a pail to bail water out of their boat. Then we must lend them a bottomless pail. Otherwise, they will pour water into our boat with that pail and make us sink into the sea. I answered the ship as usual. Then the boat came nearer and nearer. I saw some pale men standing in a row and crying aloud. For the first time in my life, I saw with my own eyes what I had been told about by other people. It was the so-called phantom boat. So close had it already approached that there seemed to be no way to avoid a collision. Without any forethought, I called out to my mates at that moment. I thought the ship struck against our boat and I lost my senses. I remained senseless until I was awakened by my mates some time afterwards. Then I learned from them that the ghost ship had attacked us. Wait, had attacked us once more at once more that night. I was only twenty years old at the time. Shocked by the horror of it all, I lay on the bottom of our boat and had a nightmare every night for a week. Even now, when I think of that, I feel my hair stand erect with fright. I have had similar experiences several times since then. An old fisherman told me this story. Oh. Dum, 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 dum. I guess uh, stories of ghost boats are, were very common back then in fishing villages, right? Since they're right next to the sea. And back in the day, the sea was like, it was super dangerous. <sighs> You're honestly kind of disappointed at the ghost ship. All right, the mirror given by the ghost. Oh, this seems like a long story. You missed the Kappa story. We didn't do a Kappa bone setter yet. Maybe we can do that. <clears throat> you want to hear fish salad mingled with blood. All right, let's do that next. <clears throat> All right, the mirror given by the ghost. There was a young man named Hayasuke in the house of Matsumoto, who served the feudal lord of Matsue as instructor in the art of the spear. Being an honest man, Hayasuke was loved by his master. He possessed a special skill in flute playing, which he displayed during his leisure. Hayasuke always had a small box with him, which he kept carefully locked. When people asked him about it, he explained no more than to say that it contained a precious object, nor did he ever show it to anyone. The young samurai of the Matsue clan, who customarily assembled to perform spear exercises in Matsumoto's exercise hall, were all very curious about the box. Several of them conferred together about the matter, and once and one day opened the box secretly while Hayasuke was taking a nap. Oh no. To their disappointment, however, they found only a little mirror in the box. When Hayasuke awoke from his nap and learned what they had done, he took great offense. He accused them of doing a dishonest deed, unworthy of a samurai. The young men made apologies for their error, saying, We were wrong. And they asked him, Why do you guard that mirror so carefully and so secretly? Hayasuke answered, Up until now, I have kept this mirror in secret, but now that it is discovered, there is no further use to maintain secrecy. I will tell you everything. So he told them the story of the mirror. <coughs> in his younger days, Hayasuke was greatly enamored of flute playing. One night, he ascended Mount Sekoin with his friend, playing on flutes under the moonlight. It was already late autumn. They wandered ab around the dewy hillside among the bare trees. Hayasuke was so much absorbed in playing the flute that he, he paid no heed when his friend said, Let's go back now. As Hayasuke did not stop his flute playing, his friend said, I'm going. 
and went away. <clears throat> then suddenly Hayasuke felt someone hold fast to his legs and pull at them with hands as cold as ice. He was startled and turned around. A beautiful woman sat on the ground. She was clad in a white dress. Her hair hung in loose tresses down to her shoulders, and her pale face wore a wistful look. Who are you? asked Hayasuke. I am a ghost, the woman answered. Being of stout heart, Hayasuke did not fear and asked the woman to tell him all about herself. Wait, to tell all about herself. The woman said, I am the wife of a merchant in the city of Matsue, but my husband is a loose man, and he has indulged in dissipation. He brought his sweetheart home and let her live with us. She was evil-hearted and hated me. One day, when I was at the well, drawing water, she pushed me down into the well. After she had killed me in this way, she reported to the police that I had committed suicide, and soon she became the legal wife of my husband. Dude. Oh, please just think of my bitter resentment. Some day I shall possess her. Wait, some day I shall possess her and wreak vengeance upon her. But the difficulty is that I cannot get into their house, because she had a charm pasted on the door which drives away ghosts. <clears throat> I want somebody to take the charm away. Many men have I accosted and tried to ask them to undertake that task, but there has never been one who did not run away from me. It is very fortunate that I met you tonight. I pray to you to grant my request. <clears throat> no. -oh. What's he going to do? My husband's house it is at Odamaki-cho in Suetsugi, and his name is such and such as a proof of my... Oh, such and such? Oh, damn, that's such and such. As a proof of my trustworthiness, I will give you this mirror. I used it whenever I blackened my teeth, and it contains my soul. So saying, she handed him a small mirror. With some suspicion, Hayasuke said, I will do as you want. Thereupon, the strange woman disappeared. Hayasuke went down the mountain, past Nakahara and Dote, and came to Odamaki-cho. He examined each house and finally found the one with a charm on the door. He reached out and took the charm down. He had walked on about ten yards when there arose a sudden clamor in that house and a man rushed out in great haste. What's the matter? asked Hayasuke. The mistress is suddenly taken ill. I'm going for the doctor, answered the man running. Afterwards, the neighbors of this house told Hayasuke when he made inquiry about when he made inquiry about the episode, that the mistress of the house died of a strange disease. She had struggled furiously, as if she were being choked and crushed on her breast by some apparition. She refused to take any medicine and died crying, I was wrong, forgive me. Hayasuke finished his story and added these words, I understand that a person will be rewarded according to the way he treats others. Ever since, this mirror has warned me against doing any evil deed. Oh, okay. Ah, well, wait, who was in the right? He kind of, um, did he cause the death of that lady? But I guess the, the lady was a, was a bad person in the first place. Yeah, what was his reason for hiding the mirror? I don't understand. <clears throat> do, 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 do. All right, what was... All right, where was the salad story? Salad, salad, salad. <clears throat> Fish salad mingled with blood. All right, let's do that. That sounds interesting. All 
Oh, oh my god. It's, it's like one paragraph. Namasu, a kind of ah, fish salad. Okay. Fish salad mingled with blood. This is a story told at Kawazoko in Tojimachi. Long ago, in the village headman's household, was very busy preparing food for New Year's Eve. There was an old dish that had been carefully kept in this house from past generations. On this occasion, they put namasu in this dish, and a maid broke it by mistake. The master of the house grew very angry and roared at her. The maid worried herself so much that she threw herself down the well. After that time, on every New Year's Eve, the namasu served in this house was mingled with blood. Therefore, the family decided never to make namasu in that house on New Year's Eve again. Okay, there you go. <clears throat> that was quick. Is there such a thing as fish salad? Yeah, isn't it? You just have salad and fish in it. Do, 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 do. Two daughters who became serpent. Oh, that sounds interesting. Let's do that. Short and sweet. The demon's cave. Okay, we knew that next. Are we going to read this entire book? All right. Two daughters who became serpents. Once upon a time, there lived a merchant in a town of Tosa. He was very greedy and used two methods of measuring, one for buying and the other for selling things, so that he would make the greatest unfair profit out of the balances. He had two daughters who were very pretty and sweet. They were much worried by their father's unjust deeds and implored him not to do such things. But the merchant was too greedy and obstinate to listen to their pleas. Gradually, the daughters realized that they would be transformed into serpents as a punishment for their father's misdeeds. At last, the elder sister plunged into the pond of Mano in the province of Sanuki and became a serpent. On the other hand, the younger sister left the home crushed with sorrow and came to an inn at Yasuda to stay the night there. Before she went to bed, she requested the maid of the inn under no circumstances ever to look into her room while she was asleep. But as is typical of human nature, the maid grew so curious that she secretly peeped into the room where the younger daughter of the merchant was sleeping, and she was frightened to see that a serpent so huge as to fill the eight-mat room, was sleeping coiled up. The serpent daughter was awakened and said that she could no longer remain a human being, wait, no longer remain a human being since her serpent nature had been detected. She sorrowfully and yet determinedly shook her head once and started out for a deep pool in the Sakase River, which flowed nearby. <clears throat> It is said that she made a tremendous rattle when she was entering the pool. She has made her dwelling there since that time. Even today, there is a saying in my native town as follows. The elder sister is in the pond of Mano in Shanshu, and the, old, and the younger sister dwells in the Sakase in Yasuda. It seems that this saying is still repeated there as a warning against greediness. Okay. So if your father is greedy, you turn into a snake. Is the... Moral of that story. <clears throat> Do -do 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 -do. Can you still drink from that well if someone throws himself in it? Hey, if you boil the water, I think you should be fine, right? The Demon's Cave. All right. Where is the Demon's Cave? Demon's Cave. Oh, it looks like another long story. Okay. It sucks being a girl in mythological Japan. Yep. Well, that's how you punish the fa that's how you punish the father, right? By punishing the daughter. <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> 
<clears throat> All right. Oh, this is about Oni. Okay, cool. The Demon's Cave. At Kamekawa Shrine, there is a stone staircase made of big stones awkwardly piled up. Long ago, in a place called Ishigaki in the suburbs of Beppushi, a, de a demon couple lived. The caves they inhabited were only six feet square. The roof stone of one cave is lifted up by a little to make the sun shine into the cave. This was done by the female demon in order to brighten up the room for her weaving. This couple came to the village every day to catch human beings and eat them. Oh, the god of the shrine in Kamekawa, Chinze Hachiro Tametomo, took pity on the villagers and decided to give some tasks to the demons for the purpose of making them stop eating people. So one day he disguised himself as a plain man and called on the demons. He said to them, If you two can make a hundred stone steps at the shrine tomorrow night, I will give you one man daily and you will not need to go out to catch them. <clears throat> <clears throat> okay, so they need to make 100 stone steps. This was a very difficult task, but the demon couple willingly undertook it. The next night, the female demon threw big stones from Ishigaki, and the male demon in Kamekawa caught them and piled them at good speed. In a short time, 99 steps were finished. Tametomo was surprised to see this and thought he had to do something. He took two pot lids and beating them, imitated a cock's crow with his voice. Thus, he signaled the dawn of the day two or three times because he could not bear to see people sacrificed to the demons. The demons heard this and went back to their caves discouraged. What a pity! Only one more step! Ah, boo. <clears throat> After that, they kept their promise to Tametomo and gave up eating the people. Now only the demons' caves remained to tell their interesting story. Oh. These are kind of like dumb demons, no? Come on. They only heard the cocks crow, but they didn't hear the, the sun come up. They didn't see the sun come up, did they? You've been to the Kamekawa Shrine? How was it? <clears throat> What is this? The girl who ate a baby? Well, we gotta, we gotta read that, right? I can't stop myself from reading that. Kappa bone setter. Okay, we can do, we can do that next. <clears throat> All right. The girl who ate a bebe. Once upon a time, three young men set out on a journey. They passed fields and mountains and traveled on and on until they came to the gate of a chocha's house. A chocha is like a, a rich peasant. There they saw a sign which announced that the chocha wanted the most able youth in the country for the husband of his daughter. This is good news for us. Let's go in and apply, they said, and went inside the gate. The chocha interviewed them. As they, saw, as they all looked like useful young men, he could not decide which one of the three was superior to the others. So he said to them, I have a thousand reap rice field to the east, a thousand reap rice field to the west, and a thousand reap rice field to the front. Each of you shall cultivate one of these fields, and I will see who is the best worker. Each of the three men was determined to become the Georgia's son-in-law. They had rice cooked in a pot large enough to supply 30 men and ate it all up. Then they be well, is that, is that what you do? Then they began cultivating the rice fields to the east, to the west, and to the front. An ordinary man might have spent 10 days cultivating one such field. These young men, however, each having two forked hoes in both hands, dug up the land so speedily that they finished the work easily in one day. All three returned from the fields at the same time. 
Uh, well, I am extremely surprised at your work today. You three have the same ability. I cannot rank you. May I ask you to stay here for a while and serve us? The Choja said. The young men willingly agreed to this proposal and stayed on as servants. Quite a few days passed, but to their disappointment, the daughter of the Choja never appeared to them. They only caught glimpses of her back, so they became very eager to see the girl. One night, two of the young men conferred together and then secretly stole into the interior of the house and peeped into the girl's room. There the girl, in white clothes with her hair loosened, had opened the floorboards at one corner. From underneath the floor, she was about to take out a box that looked like a coffin. Framed though the young men were, Curiosity overcame their fear, and holding their breath, they watched the girl. With a grin on her face, the girl drew a baby's corpse from within the coffin and cut off its arms with a knife. Then she began eating an arm as if it were some delicious food. She spoke to the young men, saying, Will you have some? And she thrust out towards them an arm dripping blood. The young men were astounded, far from wishing to become the son-in-law, they could hardly bear to stay a moment longer in such a place, and they took to their heels that same night. Now the third youth, who was making a fire in the cook stove, heard of this. He said to himself, Well, I will look and see for myself. And he went to peep into the daughter's room. He saw a she-demon in white costume, with flowing hair, eating the blood-dripping head of a baby. At first glance, he was frightened, but when he looked at her carefully, he saw not a demon nor a snake, but a girl wearing a demon's mask and eating a doll made of mochi. What he had taken for blood was merely rouge. He thought that he could eat it himself. So he said, Young lady, please give me one of this legs. So asking... So saying, he slid open the door and stretched out his hands. When the girl heard this, she replied, You have said just what I wanted to hear. Until now, many and many a young man has come here to be my husband, but at the sight of me, they became frightened and fled. No one had courage enough to stay. You are the man to be my husband. She took off the mask and the white garment and revealed herself as a surprisingly beautiful lady. The Choja was much pleased. He invited all his relatives, acquaintances, and even servants to a great feast, on which occasion he announced the, the marriage of his daughter to the young man. In due time, a child was born to them, and their offspring prospered. Okay. What was the point of that test? Of course, some, if someone sees you eat a baby, they would run away, no? What was the point of the test? That they would, eat, they, they would marry her even if she was a cannibal? <coughs> That's how you find a nice, brave young man? I see. Do I smoke? No, I do not. <clears throat> All right. That was the girl who ate a baby. What else? <clears throat> Dun, 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 dun. Oh yeah, cap <laughs> bone setter, I forgot. <clears throat> do, 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 do. The crow and the pheasant. Okay. The Kappa's occult bone-setting powers. Oh yeah, they do have that power. 
The Kappa Bone Setter. It was during the Genroku period that a bone setter named Takatori Unshoan lived at Hakata in the province of Chikzen. <clears throat> His wife was a daughter of Miyake Kakusuke, a masterless samurai in Higo. She was noted not only for her surpassing beauty, but also for her accomplishments. Late one night, it happened that while she was in the toilet, she felt some strange hand touch her buttocks. As she was a stout-hearted woman, she did not become too upset, but shouted, Rascal! Wow, she is a braver person than I. Man, if that happened to me. Then she saw in the moonlight a strange, shaggy little man running away toward the riverside. Nothing else happened that night. The next night, the wife went to the toilet with her precious short sword. While she was in the toilet, the strange creature appeared and repeated this action of the night before. The wife cried out, Rascal! And she cut off its hand with one stroke of the sword. The strange creature ran away shrieking with pain. The next morning, the wife told her husband all about what had happened and showed him the creature's hand she had cut off. It was webbed and looked something like a snapping turtle's foot. After examining it carefully, Unshoan said to his wife, Fine, fine, it's a wonderful thing. This is a kappa's hand. A kappa must have fallen for you. Anyway, you did very well. A kappa's hand is a rare thing. How disagreeable to think of being loved by a kappa. Don't say such a thing, said the wife, giving a scowl at, at her husband. But soon, as she, but soon she softened her countenance and asked, Is it really a kappa's hand? That night a voice was heard by the head of Unsho Anz's bed. It said, Give me... How do I do a kappa's voice? Give me back my hand. Uncho An was not a mere doctor, but a samurai who attended the feudal lord. He took up his bow from the tono, tohonoma and plucked the string. Then the voice stopped. The next night and the next, the same voice was heard. By the third night, Uncho An was tired of hearing it, so he spoke to it, saying, What can you want with your hand, which was cut off a few days ago? Your question is reasonable in the human world, but it is different with us. We, Kappa, can join a hand to the arm, however cold it may become, and when we join it, it will perform just as well as it ever did. So please give it back to me, I pray you, said the Kappa, showing himself before Unsho An and bowing down his head. Upon hearing this, Unsho An thought to himself, He speaks pleasingly. I will see how he sets the bones. So he said to the kappa, In truth, I determined to kill such a rascal as you on the spot with my sword the moment I saw you. But now I will return your hand to you, provided you show me how you set broken bones. That is an easy thing, said the kappa, and, upon, and on receiving his dead cold hand, it joined it skillfully to his arm before Uncho Anz's eyes. The samurai watched the kappa's action with keen interest, murmuring, That's good, that's good. Then the kappa thanked him and disappeared. The next day, there were two big fish on the fence of Uncho Anz's garden. He knew that the kappa had brought them out of gratitude, and he enjoyed them, eating them with his wife. From that time on, he practiced the method of bone setting, which he had learned from the kappa and gradually he became a famous bone setter. His family prospered for a long time, and this method of bone setting was transmitted from generation to generation. <coughs> Alright, good job. There you go. Dum, 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 dum. Do I have any Japanese music to play in the background? Um, I could. Is there any... Well, is there any um, non-copyright music to play? The Monk and the Maid, please! Okay. The Monk and the Maid. <clears throat> Japanese flute music? Okay, hold on.
Dum, 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 dum. Let's see if I have some. I'm gonna, make, I'm gonna make it really low, okay? Really, really low. Mm. All right, let's see. You can't even hear it. Hold on. Do this on the fly. There you go. <clears throat> All right, the monk and the maid. Let's do it. Alright, the monk and the maid. In and around Otsu in Omi province, they are sure to have stormy weather at the end of March every year. They call that time Hira no Hachiare. By that, they seem to mean that Mount Hira rages for, for eight days. At a little distance to the west of Yoshinaka Temple, which stands at the east gate of Otsu, there is a ferry called Ishiba. There was an inn named Hari, Harimaya, Beside that ferry, it still exists today. In former days, a young Buddhist monk spent a night there. A pretty maid of the inn fell in love with him at first sight. Unable to suppress the passion flaming in her heart, she stole into the monk's room late at night. Needless to say, she poured out all her longings for him and tried to win his affections. But the monk was a man of such strict morality that he would not be moved. However, he must have felt sympathy for the extent of the woman's love for him, for he told her that he was a hermit at the foot of Mount Hira, beyond the lake, that she should row in a big wash tub from Ishiba to his place one hundred nights continuously if her longing for him were strong enough, and that he would fulfill her desire if she could accomplish the feat. It was a very difficult task, and one by which he aimed to evade her once and forever. When the night came and the bells of the Mi temple rang out, however, she started from Ishiba in the tub and, passing the shore off Karasaki and Taka Ka Katara, reached a place from where she could see the light of the hermitage at the foot of Mount Hira. Uh -oh. After gazing at it for a while, she returned home. She continued this for ninety-nine nights. The hundredth night came. The maid was cheered by the thought of attaining her purpose at last. She rode, her, she rode over miles of waves and came to the place which commanded the view of the light. But what was the matter? There was no light, but only sheer darkness. She must have been cheated, she thought. At that moment, a storm came down from Mount Hira, 
and overturned the woman's tub in an instant. In great agony and chagrin, she was drawn to the bottom of the deep waters, as if she had been a leaf of seaweed. It was on March 20th that she was lost. Because of her passion, they say, the lake rages around that date, even now. Wah, wah. Yeah. Girl is down bad. Yeah, literally. The monk uh, was pretty, uh, I don't know. The monk didn't do the right thing either, I think. <laughs> Alright, what else? What else? What else? What else? What else? Spider pool? We can do that. <clears throat> How do I loop this music? I don't know. Damn it, I don't know. <laughs> Put it in a playlist? Oh god. I'm using VLC. Maybe I should use something else. Do, 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 do. VLC is old school. What what do you use? Um. All right. I can put it into iTunes and then I can repeat it. Okay, let me do that. All right, bear with me here. Oh, God. <clears throat> All right. Spider pool, right? That is it. Spider Pool. Zenemon, who lived in Yasaka, Shimo Kuishikimura, was an old woodcutter. One day he was working by a stream up in the mountains. There the stream flowed evenly from far within the mountains, forming itself into a deep pool on both sides of which trees grew so thickly that it was quite dark there, even in the daytime. The old man, after working a while, grew tired and sleepy, leaned against a tree on the bank, and took a nap. Then a big spider came out of the pool, wound its thread around the old man's foot, and then went back into the pool. Thus did the spider rise up again and again, repeating the same action. Then the old man woke up and noticed the spider. That is strange, he thought. Pretending to be asleep, he opened his eyes slightly and watched the spider. In the meantime, the spider repeatedly came out of the pool, wound the thread around the old man's foot, and returned to the pool. At last, the threads made a rope. 
When the spider had gone back once again into the pool, the old man took the thread off his foot and quickly wound it around the root of a big tree nearby. Just at that moment, the thread was pulled toward the pool with a loud shout, Yoyoy Sho! from the bottom of the pool. <clears throat> the old man was astonished to see the big tree trembling and shaking at last being uprooted. It was pulled harder and harder until at last it toppled into the pool. The frightened old man said to himself, Oh, I have escaped from a great danger. From that time on, that pool has been called Kumobuchi, Spider Pool. There you go. Now, that must have been a, a Jorogumo, no? Do I have any stories about Yandere ghosts? No idea. All right, what else looks interesting? The ghost of the first wife? That looks, yeah, let's try that. <clears throat> the ghost of the first wife. So I quote that to the quilt cover frame and we're trying to blah, 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 blah. Futon is a heavy, blah, blah. There was a certain handsome man among the samurai that served the feudal lord of Matsue. His wife was also very beautiful and they loved each other. All the people talked of them, wait, all the people talked of them favorably. However, fortune did not smile on them and the wife fell sick. No medicine or treatment was effective and she became seriously ill. One day, the wife took the husband's hand and said, If I die, you will marry again. I am sad to think of it. The husband answered, I will never marry again if such a thing comes to pass, so don't worry about that. The wife was glad, the wife was glad to hear his words and she died with a smile. The husband, in his grief, buried her reverently. A year passed. The husband's friends advised him to marry again, but he did not accept their advice because of the promise he had made to his wife. However, he became lonely, and gradually the memory of his wife faded. At last, he married a new wife. The days passed peacefully for some time. One day, the husband went away on business and did not return at home that night. The wife, being lonely, went to bed early. Then a woman sat at wait, then a woman sat at her bedside, looking as hazy as a cloud of smoke. What a beautiful lady you are! Your husband ought to love you, she said, and touched the wife's face with her hand. Her hand was as cold as ice. The wife thought it must be the ghost of the first wife, but she spoke no words. Afterwards, whenever the husband was not at home, the ghost would appear at night and worry the wife. At last, the wife could bear it no longer and went back to her family's house and stayed there. The husband held a ceremony on the anniversary of his first wife's death. That night, after the guest had gone away, the sister of the first wife was resting at the kotatsu. A strange drowsiness overcame her. Then the candlelight on her family altar flickered and the first wife appeared like a cloud of smoke from the altar. She came to the kotatsu and sat on it. Dear sister, I am glad to meet you, she said, and embraced her sister's shoulder. The sister cried out and called for someone to come. The ghost disappeared immediately, but the futon on the kotatsu was wet with water. Hmm. You think I've read this one before? I don't think so, right? No. <clears throat> Was wet with water? What do you mean? Um. It sounds familiar. I think I did a story, a video on the story once that's kind of familiar. Yeah, it started out the same way where the, <laughs> the first wife made him promise not to remarry. And he did.
could be wet with other things. Hey, I, <laughs> you said it, not me. <clears throat> what with blood? It said. It said. Um, it said with water, though. Yo, flatter cats. Thanks so much. I really appreciate it. I will use your money to buy some Halloween treats. Yes. <clears throat> Alright, what about this? We haven't read anything from part 8. Blood Red Pool? Mm. What with Jello? Alright, we can do the two human sacrifices. Let's do that. Wait, why did the note go all the way down there? Stop. Any stories about dragons? I don't think so. <clears throat> Alright. Human sacrifice to the river god. An old wise woman came from Miyanome in Ayaori Mura and settled at Yazaki in Matsuzaki Mura, Kamihei Gun. She had a daughter whom she cared for lovingly. The girl grew up and was married to a man who came to live with them. The young couple loved each other, but the mother disliked the son-in-law and wanted to get rid of him. In those days, the dam which supplied the villagers with water from the Sarugashi Sarugaishi River would give way several times each every year, and people were troubled by the floods. It happened again that the dam broke when the villagers were in need of water. Thrown into confusion, they gathered together and talked the matter over. At last, they decided to consult the wise woman. She, on her part, thought this a good opportunity to destroy her son in law, Dam. Accordingly, she told the people to catch a person who would be dressed in white and riding a grey horse to Tsukumoshimura the next morning and th throw him into the river as a sacrifice. The villagers assembled at the dam and waited from midnight on for a person in white dress to come by on horseback. Early next morning, the woman's son-in-law, unaware of impending disaster, dressed himself in white as he had been told to do by the mother and rode off on his grey horse. When he came to the dam, many villagers stood in his way to catch him. The son-in-law was surprised and asked them, Why are you all here? The villagers were surprised in their turn to see that the person was none other than the wise woman's son-in-law, whom they all knew very well. When, when the son-in-law heard about the matter, he said, If it is the god's word, I must obey. I will drown myself in the bottom of the river and sacrifice myself for the sake of the villagers. But a human sacrifice cannot be made by one person. A couple, a man and woman, are needed to satisfy the god. I will have my wife die with me. Oh no. Just then, the wise woman's daughter, who knew of the mother's evil plot, rushed to the scene, riding on a grey horse and dressed in white. The husband and wife rode into the river together and sank down to the bottom. The old wise woman regretted that her plan had miscarried. She also, she also jumped into the water, weeping. All at once, the sky darkened and a fierce thunderstorm lashed, at the, lashed the heavens. For three days and nights, it rained ceaselessly, and the river overflowed its banks. After the flood had subsided, the people noticed a big stone that they had never seen before. The villagers used this stone as the foundation in re reconstructing the dam. This stone was called the Wise Woman's Stone. The son-in-law and his wife were deified as gods of the dam. There is also a shrine called Bonari Myojin, where the old wise woman died. I don't know, she didn't seem very wise to me. Okay, that was a cute little story. I liked it. Dum, 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 dum. 
All right, now we got to do the princess. Stop. Wait, why does it do that? Okay. Why did she not like her son-in-law? I don't know. It didn't say. Okay, sometimes you just don't like your son-in-law. The princess who became a human sacrifice. In September of the second year of the Hogen era, Nobutsuna Tsuchimochi came to Hyuga from Mikawa and built Inoue Castle at Agatha. After that time, for 400 years, more than 15 generations, the Tsuchimochi family wielded their power over that district as feudal lords. But we cannot tell in which generation of the Tsuchimochi family the events of the following story occurred. In those days, the Gokase was divided into two streams running from the north end of Inoue Castle and encircling Mount Atago, whence it flowed into the sea. The people called the dividing point of the Gokase Suwano Wakegurula. It occurred to the lord of that period to dam the stream at Suwano Wakeguchi for the purpose, for the double purpose of shortening the distance from the castle to the houses of the warriors and of making new rice fields from the reclaimed land. The lord ordered his subjects to take up the enterprise at once. The farmers, who had been gathered together by the village headmen, tried to stop the flow of water by making a barrier with bamboo baskets filled with stones and with straw bags filled with earth, under the direction of a building magistrate. They kept working day and night, but the dam was always destroyed by strong currents of water before completion. Why on earth are you taking so long just to make a dam? When will it be completed? asked the lord angrily. One of his subjects timidly answered, we, we will complete it within ten days without fail, so would you please wait for a while? The subjects soon gathered about the village headmen and the chief farmers and informed them of their promise to the lord. However, it was clear to everybody that the completion of the dam within ten days would be impossible. No one could think of a good plan for keeping faith with their lord. A gloomy atmosphere prevailed over the group. Then the village headman said, There seems no other way but to ask the water god for help. If anybody in the village will sacrifice himself and sink into the stream, the water god will surely permit us to stop the flow of water. Everyone agreed with this proposal, <laughs> really, saying, There may be no better way indeed. Since the water god is fond of young maidens, a young girl should become the human sacrifice, of course. The matter seemed settled, but when it came to the difficult question of whom they should choose as a human sacrifice, they again bogged down. Some of the assemblage had daughters, but no one dared to propose his own daughter for the sacrifice. The conference was more, once more at a deadlock. Before long, one of the people reached this conclusion with a decided air. Let us select the maiden for the human sacrifice by lot. I demand that all the girls in the village come to the shrine of a tutelary god tomorrow morning. The next morning, the precinct of the tutelary god was swept clear, and a plain wood box decorated with a sacred straw rope was placed in front of the shrine. The village girls came there, one after another. Every girl was blindfolded and was brought up to the plain wood box. She had to draw a card out of the box while, f while blindfolded. Soon the turn of the only daughter of the headman came. She had no longer drawn out a card than an agitation developed among the caretakers who surrounded her. The headman turned pale. The lot has fought. Oh. The lot had fallen upon the very daughter of the headman. Before long, there was a fuss throughout the village. How sorry I am for the headman. He invited the misfortune of his own accord. Everyone expressed his sympathy toward the headman, but no one could change the situation. 
At the headman's house, all of his family sat around the daughter, lamenting bitterly. The rumor that the sacri sacrificial victim had been chosen reached the castle by and by. There lived a princess, daughter of the Lord Shimochi. She was very sweet, sweet and fair, but unfortunately crippled since childhood. Feeling intense shame for her deformity, she was wont to confine herself deep within the castle. The rumor of the human sacrifice somehow reached the ears of this princess. She asked the lord, her father, Please make me, make me the human offering to the Gokase. As at the sudden request of the princess, the lord was frightened and tried to persuade and coax her not to do such a thing. However, the princess was firm in her determination and spoke as follows, I have no pleasure in living like this, for I am a cripple. I hear that the daughter of the headman is only, is, is, well, I hear that the daughter of the headman is his only daughter. It is too cruel to make her the human sacrifice. It is like plucking a budding flower. I can imagine how bitterly her family grieves. If you make me the human sacrifice in her place, not only will the headman be delighted, but the village people will be thankful for your deep mercy from the bottom of their hearts. Such a deed must, must ensure good for the future of our family. So please accept my plea, father. At such sincere words from their daughter, the Lord and his wife could do nothing but accede to her request and give her, and give her up to death. When, he, when the appointed day came, the princess was beautifully dressed in her best and drowned herself in the waters of the Gokase. The noble act of the princess must have moved the water god, for the strength of the torrents speedily slackened. The farmers lost no time in stopping the current of one branch of the river, so the difficult construction was at last completed. The villagers cherished the virtue of the princess so much that they later deified her in the Shisha shrine of Wakamiya Hachimangu. It still remains at Sus Suano Wakeguchi. Every year when the season comes, the village people make, made it a rule to offer the first catch of sorrel to the shrine. It is said that the deified princess was fond of sorrel in her lifetime. Okay. That was also a cute little story. <laughs> All right. Moral, it's important to teach ableism to the ancient Japanese. Yep. You're a cripple? Well, your life is over. You might as well jump off a bridge. That's the story. Oh, blood red pool. Let's do that. Doop, 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 doop. All right. All right, well, we're going to wind down, okay? Only a couple more stories, and then we should be good. <clears throat> Blood Red Pool. A river about 90 feet wide runs through Kuwanomura, Nakagun, Tokushimaken, and Shikoku, in Shikoku. Once a Buddhist pilgrim came to this village and asked for a night's lodging at a rich man's house. He carried with him a golden cock and a mosquito net, excuse me, kept in a small box in one inch square. The master of the house heard about those things after they had talked on various matters. He had an evil desire to take those <laughs> he had an evil desire to take those things. Early in the next morning, the pilgrim left the house. The master followed after him, and when he came to a pool of the river, the master killed the pilgrim with his sword and threw him down into the pool. At that moment, the golden cock flew away, flapping its, his wings, and the master obtained the mosquito net only. The water of this pool became red with the blood of this pilgrim, and the pool gained the name of Nigori Ga Fuchi. 
Gorigar Fuji, Blood Red Pool. At the house of the man who killed this pilgrim, they do not pound mochi, because if they do, blood is mingled with the mochi. It is said that the mosquito net is still kept in this house. Nice. All right, let's do how about two more stories and then we should be good. All right, choose wisely. Do, 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 do. Serpent, serpent goddess. The badger, oh. Badger means tanuki in this, um, in this book, I think. The Blind Serpent Wife. Serpent Goddess. Alright, we're gonna do the Serpent Goddess. The Serpent Goddess of Amogaike. People pray for rain at this pond, and they believe that there is a goddess in the pond, that it is a big snake, and that this snake goddess dislikes anything made of metal, so the people cannot use iron hooks when they fish here. A long time ago, a brave samurai of the Mar Muramats clan went into the pond to see the big serpent with his own eyes. He found a splendid palace at the bottom of the pond. There was a noble lady wearing a gorgeous dress and dancing, her embroidered sleeves swinging. She must have been surprised to see the fine samurai suddenly appear. He told her the reason why he had come there. When the princess heard it, she said, This is not a place where you should come. Please go away immediately. Her bright, pretty face instantly became sorrowful, and she burst into tears. For a while, the samurais gazed at her beautiful figure, and then he asked her politely why she was crying. The lady looked up at his face wistfully and answered, I am sorrowful because, since you have seen me, I cannot live in the pond anymore, so I cry. She stood up and, taking the samurai's hand, led him into the palace. After she had entertained him with splendid foods from lands and sea, she sent him off. That evening, the neighboring villagers were overtaken by a sudden storm. They thought that it was caused by the offended serpent, and they were very much afraid. Late at night, a beautiful girl visited Sakai in, in Kasaborimura. She entered his, his room, sat by his pillow, and said, I am the daughter of a woodcutter who lived in the mountain. My father was taken away by somebody, and I am now in trouble. Please help me. As he was a gallant man, he granted the girl's request on the spot. Afterwards, they loved each other and married. Of course, this girl was the big serpent who was afraid of the samurai, whom she had met in the pond. So she came and visited Sakai to ask his help. From that time on, all the heirs of the Sakai family have had three scales under their armpits. Okay, I guess. Alright guys, last story. Armpit skills, you have those? Peepzilla? Last story. A lot of human sacrifices here. Which one? Wu? What is Wu? I didn't see that. Wu! Oh. Alright, we gotta do that then. Alright, last one. Ooh. 
One day, Xu Zhu was invited to dinner by his uncle. Uncle, uncle, said Xu Zhu during the course of the dinner. This is very delicious. What do you call it? Don't you know, said the uncle, laughing. That's called a dumpling. Not wanting to forget, not wanting to forget the name. As Xu Zhu walked home, he kept saying, Dumpling, dumpling. Along the way, he came to a steep, difficult slope filled with large boulders. When he was finally at the bottom of the slope, he said, Poo, poo. And he walked on, saying, Woo, woo, all the way home. I'm back, he called to, wait, I'm back, he called to his wife. Make me some woos. <laughs> Make me some woos. His wife was surprised at these sudden words. What's a woo? she asked. I don't know such a thing. I ate a woo at uncle's. It was called a woo, and I want to eat one now. You ought to know about such things as woos, don't you understand? No, I don't. There's no such food as a woo. Not in Japan, and not in China, not in India either. What a stupid woman. A woman like this is no good as a wife. And Shuju picked up the bamboo fire blower that was at his hand and hit his wife's forehead with it. Ouch! You hit me too hard, the wife cried, rubbing her forehead. Look, it's made a lump as big as a dumpling. When Shuju heard this, he cried, That's it! Dumpling! Dumpling! Uh, what? <laughs> awesome story. Love it. <laughs> I'm sure there's some translation uh, things. Dumpling and woo must sound alike, I guess. This guy should be made into a woo. Mm. That's not how you, how you say woo, though. How do you say woo? Will? Will? Okay. That's a good story to end on. Yeah. Alright guys. How did you like that? We went for two hours. Okay, not bad, not bad. Hmm. Will you? Wii U? There you go. That was, um, uh, stories. Folk tales for Halloween. Glad you liked it. Um. How did one packet of Pucky last two hours? Because I didn't eat. I was reading the entire time. I can't eat while reading. Alright, guys. Um, thanks for joining. Happy Halloween. Um, I um, hope you guys have fun. Um, and uh, I'll see you next year for next Halloween. <laughs> Until next time, guys. I love you. Thanks for joining. Bye.